and welcome to City Breaks Bath, Episode 5, Gorgeous Georgian Architecture. One of the really defining characteristics of Bath is surely those lovely crescents and squares. The elegant 18th century buildings which prompted Haydn to comment when he visited in 1794, Bath is one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. Yes, I think I'd agree. So why is that? Well, there's the harmony, all those golden stones, the fact that much of it was built in one era in the 18th century, which means that it very much looks as if it all should fit together. There was a French traveller, one Louis Simon, who came to visit in 1810, who wrote the following. All the streets are straight and regular. The town looks as if it had been cast in a mould all at once, so new, so fresh and regular. So yes, it's definitely in the 18th century that we need to start, with talk of the building boom that took place then. Bath was fashionable, so it attracted lots of visitors and their money. Some of that money could be channelled into building works, and in a sort of chicken and egg situation, of course, the fact that the buildings were so beautiful attracted yet more people to visit. So a building boom there definitely was. One which prompted Horace Walpole to comment in 1791, Bath shoots out into new crescents, circuses and squares every year. In fact, he didn't know it, but that was really very much at the end of the building boom, because there were other things to pay for at the very end of the 18th century and up to 1815, mostly wars with France. We certainly have been left with many stunning buildings and roads, but in fact, some of the grandiose projects didn't get seen through to the end. More about that later. And it certainly remains true that the fact that many of the main beauties in Bath architecture, so Queen Square, the Royal Circus, the Royal Crescent, were all built within quite a short period of time. And other factors which add to the harmony of the whole town would be, yes, the use of the Bath Stone, so easily available from the nearby quarries in the Mendips. What good fortune that it had such a lovely creamy colour, one which looks its absolute best in sunshine, and also that it's quite easy to build with. As explained by, of all people, the composer Haydn. This stone, he wrote, is very soft, so soft, in fact, that there's no trouble to cut it up into any desired shape. And another factor that adds to the unity and harmony of the whole place is the fact that really there was a very small number of key people involved in the building projects. And so they had quite clear ideas about what they were trying to achieve because they were influential and in some cases rich, they could have what they wanted. So, let me introduce you to the three key players. One, Ralph Allen, was a local businessman who'd made a fortune as Bath's deputy postmaster. He had some really good ideas about building up a postal service, particularly from Bath to London, that made a mass of money, which he then invested in quarries outside Bath, which made him a lot more money, and also meant that both the cash that he'd earned and the stone that he was quarrying could be poured into the project of beautifying Bath, with lots of wonderful architectural projects of the very most fashionable type. And then the other two key players are a father and son combo, both called John Wood, John Wood the Elder, and John Wood the Younger, architects. John Wood the Elder, born in 1704, had a long career, mainly in Bath, which culminated in the design and building of the Royal Circus, but in fact, he'd been planning it for years before he ever got started. As early as 1735, so just over the age of 30, he was drawing maps of Bath, outlining his idea for a new elegant building project to replace some of the cramped medieval streets. And sure enough, it was not long until his first big project in Bath, Queen Square, came to fruition. He also designed North and South Parades in the 1740s, and the Royal Circus was his project too, although in fact he died before it was completed and the work had to be taken over by his son. Not only did he have very definite ideas about how he wanted the bath that he was designing to look, he also had a very clever way of operating, which meant that he could actually put most of it into practice. So, to explain his modus operandi, he would lease the land for one of his grandiose projects, divide it up into individual sites, do the initial design himself so that there would be a unity across the whole project, and then, this is the clever bit, he would sublet the plots. So other people were chipping in, helping to pay for the projects, 
but he kept overall control of what they were going to look like. Hence the harmony of Queen Square and also of the Royal Circus. And then I must just mention briefly his son, John Wood the Younger, who continued his father's work after his father had died, so completing the Royal Circus to Dad's plan, of course, and then moving on to the Royal Crescent, possibly the city's grandest project of the whole lot. Both of them were working to very distinctive design ideas, and if you're interested in finding out a lot more about that, the place to go is the Museum of Bath Architecture, where all will be explained. But I'll have a go at summarising what the thinking was. So, Bath's very distinctive style of architecture is based on the principles of symmetry and proportion, which actually come from classical ideas, so originating in ancient Greece, being developed by the Romans, and although they disappeared somewhat during the Dark Ages, they were brought back to life during the Italian Renaissance. So, in 15th century Italy, and then by the 17th century in England, there were architects here, in Ego Jones for example, very much leaning on these ideas, and creating from them a new idea for architectural style known as Palladianism. So think clean classical lines, symmetry, pillars, and as I say, if that's a particular interest, then do head to the Museum of Bath Architecture to find out more. For there you will see 18th century architectural books and John Wood's drawing instruments. You'll see actual bits and pieces from Bath buildings. So, for example, they have the original balustrade from Queen Square, which was eventually removed and replaced by iron railings. But by looking at it and reading the explanations, you begin to understand a bit more about the architecture design ideas that John Wood, Senior and Junior, were drawing on. Also in the museum, you can see a stone acorn from a parapet on the circus and an explanation saying, yes, they decided to place acorns along the top of the buildings in a reference to the legend of how Bath was founded. If you think about Bladud and his leprous pigs, who went foraging in forests for acorns and were miraculously cured by the healing properties of the mud, so close to the hot springs, of course, all of this giving Bladud the idea that perhaps humans too could be cured and founding, therefore, the whole idea that Bath could serve as a spa town. All of that encapsulated in the acorns along the top of the parapet of the circus buildings. And one of the highlights of the museum, a model, 1 to 500 scale, which took, wait for it, 10,000 hours to build and was commissioned in the 1960s by the Bath Preservation Trust because they feared that some of Bath's loveliest buildings were going to disappear. They were threatened with demolition. And while their effort to preserve them successful in quite a few cases actually, was made, they also set about capturing what there was in case it should be lost. So this model's architectural details are as accurate as they can possibly be. The model of the circus, for example, has pencil leads in place of columns, and as they definitely wanted the acorns around the parapet as well, they took sanded down hat pins and fixed them carefully in place. It's a really interesting little museum, and definitely the place to go if you want to find out more. OK, so let's have a look at some of the main projects from the 18th century building boom, starting with Queen Square, which was completed in 1736, which I have seen described as, quote, the birthplace of the Georgian Terrace. So the four sides of the square were designed to be a uniform whole, formal style, and with, in the centre, a pool, which actually was originally designed as a water supply for each of the houses, and an obelisk in the middle of the pool. Today, in fact, the pool has disappeared, but the obelisk remains. It was erected in 1738 in honour of a visit to Bath by Frederick, Prince of Wales, the heir to George II, although, in fact, he never did become king because he died, I think, in an accident involving a cricket ball before his father. He's rather a sad character all round, actually. I found a quote by his mother on him which really might be one of the most heartless things I think I've ever read. Imagine writing this about your own child. Frederick, she wrote, was, quote, the greatest ass and the greatest liar and the greatest canai and the greatest beast in the whole world, and I heartily wish he was out of it. I can't help wondering how she felt when her wish came true, and he died in an accident way before his time. 
Anyway, Queen Square, despite the fact that it's a bit of a throughway for traffic these days, is certainly one of the loveliest spots in Bath, and I would suggest if you can creep along there at a quiet moment in the day, very early or in the evening perhaps, then you'll find it a lovely spot to stand and ponder. Tobias Smollett, the author of a fictional travel guide called The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker, was a fan. As you'll hear in later episodes, Tobias Smollett didn't like everything about Bath, but he did like Queen Square, writing about it that, quote, The square, though irregular, is on the whole pretty well laid out, spacious, open and airy, and in my opinion, by far the most wholesome and agreeable situation in Bath. And I think when you stand in the middle and contemplate the four sides of it, you will agree that John Wood achieved his own ambition, which was to build a lot of grand houses and make them appear, as he put it, as one magnificent structure, by making sure that the facade of each building on each of the four sides had a unity and a harmony to it. Moving on then to the Royal Circus, which was begun in 1754 by John Wood the Elder, Things there were a little more complicated, because originally the site was on a slope, so before they did any building, they had to level it off. But finally they managed that, and the really quite unusual idea for a circular street was built. So there are three terraces of eleven houses each, and three roads leading in, or indeed out. John Wood the Elder had actually said that his ambition was to build in Bath, quote, a new Rome. So perhaps he would be pleased if he found out that Tobias Smollett said that he thought the circus reminded him of the Roman Colosseum, but turned inside out. Again, very classical in design. Each building has three main stories, all supported by columns. In fact, if you look carefully, the columns on each level are different. Each design having a Greek-sounding name, they being Doric, Ionic and Corinthian. I think you need to head to the Museum of Architecture to understand that more fully, and there are carefully planned and relatively understated decorations as well. So the aforementioned acorns, right up on top, and along the frieze separating the first and second floors, various motifs, nautical, military, mythical. And such was the success of the project that it became really one of the most exclusive addresses in Bath, and there's a whole list of famous people who have lived at one time or another in some of the buildings. Two Prime Ministers, William Pitt the Elder, number 7, and Gladstone, number 27, and then various other worthies like Clive of India, who lived at number 11, and the explorer David Livingstone, who lived at number 13, and the artist Gainsborough, number 17. John Wood the Elder had laid the foundation stone, but he died not too long after that, so his son took it over, following Dad's plans, of course, although in fact the last detail a planned statue of George the Second on his horse to be put in the middle, never did materialise. If you arrive at the circus on the approach road that leads up from the main part of the town, and then take the left-hand turning out again, you'll be on Brock Street, which will lead you to what is surely the pièce de résistance of all the architecture in Bath, namely the Royal Crescent, described in, I think it was the rough guide, as Bath's grandest architectural statement. Oh yes, a place indeed where actually all 30 houses are Grade 1 listed buildings, because, as it says in the citation, the Crescent is, quote, the most famous set piece in Georgian town architecture, a milestone in town planning. It took eight years to build, surely that's remarkably quick, and it was completed in 1767. It's 200 metres long, there are 114 columns, you'll notice Bang in the middle, the very centre house, has double pillars, and every house is in uniform style. Three storeys, or three main storeys, plus a basement and a garret. The latter being mainly the domain for the servants, who kept the wealthier residents on the middle three floors, supplied with everything they needed. And if you're wondering what it was like to live inside one of these magnificent buildings in the 18th century, Then let me mention here, and come back to later in the episode, the fact that Number One Royal Crescent is now a museum at which you can find out exactly that. This too was very popular with the composer Haydn, visiting soon after it was finished and commenting on what he thought was the most beautiful aspect of the whole thing, and that was 
the setting. The crescent sits on a hillside and looks down over a vast expanse of beautiful green lawns. The building, he wrote, was, quote, shaped like a half-moon and more magnificent than any I had seen in London. So those are definitely the big three, Queen Square, the Circus and the Crescent. But quick mention too to North and South Parade, also built in the 18th century, as places for people to promenade. Visitors to Bath would write to their friends back home, commenting on how Bath had made pavements so that you could walk through the town without getting your shoes muddy. Quite a new idea. This is explained nicely in The Traveller's History of Bath, as follows. Quote, Here, fashionably dressed visitors to Georgian Bath would take a leisurely stroll to see and be seen, pausing for introductions, assignations, invitations and conversation. Telling us then that the architecture had contributed to the way people led their lives in Bath, to the social aspects. And in fact, so popular was this that it wasn't long until they extended the North and South Parade with parade gardens, giving even more space for people to walk about to not much purpose other than to see who they might meet. And I'd like to make mention too of two particularly special buildings in Bath, the Pump Room and the Assembly Room. Again, both 18th century buildings. So the Pump Room was originally built in 1706, although it was much enlarged in the 1790s. If you stand outside it, you will soon see its classical-looking pillared façade, and in fact there's even a Greek inscription up on the top, which translates as something like, Water is the greatest essence. It's in use today as a really rather posh tea room, where you can not just sip tea but also be entertained by, perhaps, a musical quartet. But just to sit inside is to look at the 18th century elegance of the room, with its large proportions and its high ceiling, its coving and its chandeliers. And then there are also the assembly rooms, built between 1769 and 71, this time also by John Wood the Younger, and a place which soon became a centre for fashionable society. Various different rooms were designed for the various activities which made up 18th century social life. So the largest of them is the ballroom, 105 feet long, the largest Georgian room in Bath. More coving, more chandeliers, a place where Jane Austen and her characters enjoyed minuets and country dances. Also in the assembly rooms is the tea room, specially designed so that people could partake of the new drink of tea, perhaps with sugar, both relatively newly imported into Britain and linked, of course, to the slave trade. And although there certainly were abolitionists in Bath in the 18th century, many people, I think, didn't think of these matters. They went to the tea rooms for polite conversation, a bit of flirting, perhaps some matchmaking. Two more rooms in the same building, the octagon room and the card rooms, where there was more socialising, not least some gambling. But not on a Sunday, when it wasn't allowed, and instead there were organ recitals. At least one of these rooms is in use as a cafe today, so that's a good way to get inside. And actually, I noticed on the Assembly Rooms website, there's a virtual tour which gives you a good look round all four of the rooms. You may be aware that most of the buildings and roads that I've talked about so far are all in one area of Bath, but there is another area with some quite extensive Georgian architecture, which I'd like to mention too, and that's the area just across Pulteney Bridge, which centres around Great Pulteney Street. Pulteney Bridge was built in about 1760 in a deliberate move to open up the other side of the river and extend the city. And sure enough, in the late 1780s, one Sir William Pulteney came along and used some of his considerable wealth to finance very elegant streets that you can see there still today, which centre around Great Pulteney Street. A long, elegant, straight, wide street, Georgian houses down both sides, Laura Place at one end, and the Holborn Museum, with its classical facade at the other. And if you look at the houses down Great Pulteney Street, you'll see again that very Georgian design. Uniformity, look at the carved detail on the first floor windows, for example, all built in Bath stone, of course, and described as follows in 1800 in a book called British Tourists. Quote, The new streets are commodiously wide and of great extent. 
The most beautiful is called Great Pulteney Street. It is built in a uniform manner, and the several orders of architecture having been preserved through the whole. The effect is magnificent in the extreme. So by the several orders of architecture he means adhering to the classical principles outlined a little earlier in the episode. The whole thing added up to a very fashionable area where a number of famous people lived, including even royalty, one of the French Louis, for example, and Napoleon III, and where also it's known that the abolitionist William Wilberforce lived too. And actually that's interesting because we know that Sir William Pulteney made his money from plantations, i.e. from the slave trade, something we ought to remember even though we might still admire the architecture. Perhaps you will enjoy hearing that actually he ran out of money, and in fact you can see that still today. If you walk down Great Pulteney Street, you can see that some of the side streets, or planned side streets, are actually very short, because they were never finished, because it all cost a bit more than they thought, and so some of it didn't get built at all. So much then for the exteriors of Georgian Bath. But, as I mentioned earlier, if you're intrigued to know what life was like inside one of these buildings, in their heyday, then a really good place to find out more is the museum called Number One Royal Crescent, where most of the building has been restored and decorated inside using the knowledge gleaned from years of research on interior decor, furniture, etc. And if you wander around from room to room, it becomes quite easy to think yourself back into the 18th century and feel that you are snooping round somebody's house. The symmetry that's such a key feature of the external architecture can be seen inside too, bringing, as the guidebook says, a sense of order and restraint to the interior spaces. Clean, elegant lines, well-proportioned rooms, friezes with little stylized decorations on them, regular patterns on carpets and wallpaper, all very elegant, but not too showy. Let me take you on a little room-by-room room tour of what you'll find if you go to visit. So there's the parlour, the family room that was a comfortable space for everyday activities, a place where often breakfast was taken, being a rather informal meal, a place with a bureau bookcase, because the owner of the house would often be here in his townhouse, but he'd own a country estate too, so he'd have letters to write and admin to deal with. I enjoyed seeing the bureau actually in the parlour, because one of the lower drawers opens up to reveal that there's a chamber pot inside. Next door to the parlour was a room labelled, as it surely couldn't be today, the Gentleman's Retreat, described as, quote, a sanctuary where a cultured Georgian gentleman might indulge his interests in science, inventions and the natural world. And sure enough, there are objects in there that represent the Age of Enlightenment, things that the owner would have collected on one of his grand tours, perhaps. There's a globe, there are books on world cultures. And still on the ground floor, across the hallway, the dining room. Bizarrely, I noticed it said in the guidebook that dining rooms in those days were often designed in quite a masculine way, because really, what they represented, being the room where your guests might spend some time, was the status of the host. The furniture included a sideboard with lots of different compartments, one for wine bottles, one for a basin for washing the glasses, a lead-lined drawer to keep the plates warm, and, pleasingly, another drawer for the chamber pot. I gleaned the information that although the ladies often went off to a different room to use the chamber pot, the gentlemen were not above using it right here in situ, possibly behind a screen. Marvellous. The table was laid for dessert, lots of sugary sweetmeats, marzipan fruits, syllabubs, jellies, etc. And alongside the following information poster. Such luxury came at a terrible human cost. As the British sweet tooth grew, demand for sugar increased and the British transatlantic slave trade flourished. By the 1770s, the stolen labour of thousands of enslaved Africans was producing the £12 per person of sugar consumed annually in Britain in rooms such as this one. Moving upstairs to the first floor, there is the withdrawing room, i.e. the room that you would withdraw to, often the ladies would withdraw to after a meal, the gentlemen remaining at the table. And so this room would often have an elegant, lighter, more feminine touch in its decoration. Silk damask on the walls, upholstered chairs, a chandelier, gilded detailing on things like picture frames and teacup edges and mirrors, 
because while your guests were sitting, possibly drinking their tea, by candlelight, then these little gold edges would all glisten. The British cuppa in those days was apparently known as a dish of tea because the teacups had no handles. I noticed that here too there was an explanation to do with slavery, noting in fact that from the 1790s there were people who refused to take sugar in their tea because they wanted to support the abolition movement. And there was a name for these people, they were known as anti-saccharites. Across the hallway on that floor was the ladies' bedroom, where the lady of the house would not only sleep in her four-poster bed, with its flowery curtains that could be pulled across for privacy, but she would also do her toilette in here with the help of her maid. Perhaps a close friend might be invited to attend, so they could swap a bit of gossip or some fashion tips, and here it would be that the lady of the house might perhaps apply scented wax to her hair to create one of those elaborate 18th-century styles, or maybe she would do her makeup using... Oh no, a white paint to create a pale complexion, which was lead-based and which, at the time, they didn't realise, was poisonous. There was here a wooden washstand, reminding us that there are no bathrooms to be had in the house anywhere. So this one had a Worcester porcelain bowl on it and a water bottle, apparently called a guglet, because that was the sound it made when you poured the water out. There was a sewing table too, and bits and pieces from a lady's bedroom, for example, a patch box in which she kept her artificial beauty spots and a wig scratcher to which she would turn for relief if she had lice. The gentleman's bedroom was up on the second floor, a bit less elaborate, but also with equipment to make up for the lack of bathroom. So here, a mahogany shaving table containing, as it said on the note, the full apparatus, mirror, wash bowl, compartments for soap, bottles and razor, even a pull-out chamber pot for nighttime use. You can visit the basement too, which contained the kitchen and the scullery. An 18th century townhouse scullery, said the notes, was often cramped, hot and poorly lit, but skilled cooks could still produce everything from roasts to stews and sauces to syllabubs. There was all sorts of kitchen equipment, much of which was quite recognisable, pans and saucepans and spoons and sieves, some a bit less usual, spice boxes for example, and hanging racks for the food because if you didn't hang it out of the way, the mice would get it. The mouse trap would be in pretty constant use, and there was a range of ovens and fires for different cooking procedures. A coal fire range for roasting, for example, or a copper boiler for boiling up meat and puddings. Next door to the kitchen was a second room, the scullery, where all the cleaning and washing took place. Flagstone floors, big sinks and other fire so that you could heat the flat irons. This would have been the domain of one of the lowliest servants of all, the scullery maid, who would spend hours in here washing and scrubbing, and maybe also doing the household washing, although in fact a lot of houses sent that out. There were people living in the surrounding villages who made their living from taking in washing. So it took a whole hierarchy of servants to keep this house running. The cook was traditionally a man, although during the 18th century they realised that if women did it, then you could pay them much less, so that became a popular thing. I was told that whereas it would cost about £60 annually to employ a male cook, particularly if he was French, which was the most sought after of all, but that you could probably get away with paying a female cook only about £10 a year. If the scullery maid was the lowliest servant, then at the other end of the hierarchy would be the housekeeper and the butler. The housekeeper's status in the house, in fact, meant that she actually had her own bedroom and often ate separately from the servants. The servants would have a servant's hall to eat in and sleep up on the top floor of the garret. You can visit the housekeeper's room down here, which gives you an indication of the sort of jobs that she was doing. So there's a desk in there for her to use for all the ordering she had to do and to pay the bills. There's a china closet and a linen cupboard and cupboards for storing spices and candles. All of these to be kept locked because you couldn't trust the servants not to be stealing some of it. The butler too had his own pantry and often his own bedroom. Both of these were down in the basement along with the servants' hall where they would eat together. And on the wall there was a set of rules indicating that they were fairly strictly kept under control. I think that was the duty of the housekeeper. So one or two of the rules, just to finish off, were as follows. No one should swear on oath or speak an immodest word at any time. 
No one should quarrel or make any disturbance whatsoever. No one should use any knife or fork but their own. And, possibly my favourite, no one should come dirty or without their clothes to any meal. And at the end, the statement that any offence you committed would cost you one penny, known as a forfeit, and that all forfeits would be spent at Christmas. So this house, at number one Royal Crescent, in keeping with all the other houses in the Crescent and many other of the fancier houses across the city of Bath, very much had an upstairs-downstairs existence, where the upstairs residents, the wealthy residents, whose income sometimes came from rather dubious sources, were looked after, cosseted, if you will, by a whole host of ordinary people whose lives really weren't very much their own, and who had to keep to a strict set of rules, rather actually as if they were children. So that's it then for today's episode. I hope I've left you much better able to imagine the life that went on in the streets of Bath and behind the facades of the elegant houses, in the squares and streets and crescents of Georgian Bath. Next week's episode, Staying in the 18th Century, I'm going to call it The Season, 18th Century Style, because I'd like to have a look at all the things that people got up to in Bath by way of entertainment when they came down to do a season in Bath. They may well have come partly for health reasons, but when they got here, there was a whole elaborate social scene going on as well. And I think it'll be interesting to have a look at that and find out what these people were actually doing. Okay, so for the moment, thank you very much for listening. I hope that you'll be able to join me next week. And until then, farewell. Goodbye.